right, we are live, everybody. Let me go close the door, and then we'll get started in just a minute here. Pull up our slide. So today we are doing Beyond the Traditional Camera. Uh, we'll get started in a couple minutes here. Um, as always, if anyone has questions while we're teaching the class, by all means go ahead and chat anything that you have and I'll answer it live on screen as long as it's appropriate. Um, but today we're really going to be learning about things like drones, GoPros, camcorders, 360 cameras, things that are not excuse me, things that are not necessarily your simple DSLR or mirrorless or um, uh, bridge camera. We're looking at things that extend your camera or your photography or your cinematography skills. They extend them a little further. So in about one minute here, we'll get started. I think we've waited a long enough. Let's get started. So, beyond the traditional camera, let's start from the very beginning. So, why do we go past our camera? So we have possibly a cell phone, maybe we have a DSLR, we have a mirrorless camera, um, but what's the real purpose for why we want to advance past just the camera? We've learned it so well, we have all the skills, we have the information, and we utilize these products for either, for any purpose. Um, one of the big reasons we would want to go past our regular cameras for portability and travel. When you look at things like GoPros or 360 cameras or even drones, they're very small, they're compact, they're easy to pack in our bag if we're traveling or going out of the state or country, and it makes it really easy to bring along with us as a tag along product. Durability. Uh, most of these cameras, GoPro, drones, uh, 360 cameras, they're extremely durable, they're waterproof, they can usually go under feet for about underwater for about 25 feet before they stop working. Um, they have good battery life, and they're one of those products where you don't have to be as delicate with them. If you drop or you ding it around a little bit, they're very durable products, they're meant to take a beating for the most part. Which also moves into waterproofing as well, like I said with the GoPro, some action cameras you're going to get at least 25 feet or 50 meters underwater before you need to start worrying about a case or some other product. Recording time. A lot of these products have a very significant amount of recording time on there. Some of our fancier mirrorless or DSLR cameras have limits. We have 30 minute limits where we can only record for such a long period of time before the camera no longer allows us to record, we then have to start and stop the video. So the recording time can be really long on these products. And the ability to fly or record over great distances, and that's really the drone category. With the drones, we have the ability to send the drone out and almost to get a few miles, maybe multiple miles away from us. And that signal that the drone is getting and the video frequency that it's picking up, it's still able to show that even over that distance. So we can really do some cool things with the drones that we as humans are limited because we don't either, number one, we can't fly, but number two, we also don't have access to things like helicopters or bigger setups to then use a larger format camera. Drones are really unique in that sense because they have a small, powerful camera built into it. Now, whenever we're taking pictures, and I use this in the intro to cameras class as well too, I think it's important to talk about SD cards. So where do your pictures go and make sure you have two of them. 
Uh, SD cards are going to be the fundamental or foundational source that we're going to have in order to save our images or videos. Without an SD card, there's really not much we can do. Certain products that like DJI makes or GoPro makes, they will have some internal storage on there. Typically about 8 gigabytes worth of storage. However, if you're using those products and you're recording, 8 minutes, depending on the quality of video that you're recording, it's going to take up a lot of space. And so therefore, you know, if we're doing a 4K video, 8 gigabytes might get us about 10 minutes worth of eight, about a 4K recording. So it's not much that we're saving with that. So having an SD card is extremely important in order to make sure that we're recording and saving all of the information that we're getting as we're going. So like I said, micro or uh, SD cards are going to be required, but micro SDs are going to be the main thing we're looking at. Products like your DJI drone, products like your GoPro or your action cameras or your 360 cameras, they can't take a larger size SD card. They require a micro SD card. Micro SD cards are typically a little bit smaller and they usually come with an adapter like you see on the right hand image where the adapter itself will be used for you to insert the micro SD and then therefore you're able to get the information off the micro SD without needing a special kind of reader. But almost all cameras are going to have some to no internal storage. So again, things like DJI might have about 8 gigabytes. But things like your GoPro or things like your camcorder or things like your Insta360, they might have no storage on there. So you're going to need an SD card of some sort. You want to make sure you get something with a good read and write speed. Your read and your write speed is very essential as far as making sure the information from the camera is saved to the card in a timely or a good fashion. Um, that being said, I would recommend getting something that's at least 64 gigabytes or higher. That's going to be a really good start. You're going to get a good amount of footage time on there, probably anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes, maybe even an hour depending on the quality of video that you have. But I would strongly suggest looking at something like a 128 or a 256. The more amount, the more storage you can have on the product, the better it is in the long run of everything. So keep that in mind. Your pictures should never live on the memory card. The memory card is really meant for you to take the photos from one product and move them over to the other. It's the vehicle, if you will. If, let's say, the camera that you're using is the house, your computer is then work, and that SD card is going in between the two in order to deliver the images from one device to the other or vice versa. So when we're going about doing these things, it's important to remember that they don't live on the card. The card is temporary. The card is meant for you to save your images via the device and then move them over, clear the card, and then use it again. So my process for doing this is pretty simple. First thing you're going to do when it comes to taking and transferring the images from any of these products is land the drone or turn off the camera unit or do both. So again, if you're flying, land the drone first, then make sure you turn the product off before physically removing the card. Same thing for any other camera, turn the camera off before you remove the card itself. Once you've turned the device off, you want to wait that five seconds before removing the card. This ensures during that five seconds that everything has a time to turn off, power down, settle, save to where it's appropriately supposed to be saving. You're making sure that the, that the device that you're using has properly turned off, powered off, and saved everything that needs to be saved. If we don't wait that time and we just immediately go to take the SD card out, there's a chance that we can lose some of the information that we just acquired from shooting or filming or recording. After that, we're going to place it into a card reader. So that micro SD card, we're going to insert that into a card reader. We don't want to use the camera, drone, or product to read the card or send pictures from the camera. A lot of people like to use that feature on there, and that's absolutely fine. You can. However, by doing that, you're significantly lowering the battery life for the product. And so if you're one of those people that you're recording or doing stuff and you want to make sure that that all gets saved properly um, and does, doesn't have any issues for you, then you want to make sure that you're using the card reader to transfer all of that over. If you are a little more on the careful side, you don't want to buy a product like that, you can always use the camera or device to transfer the photos. 
just be aware that the battery life itself will go down significantly. And if that's the only battery that you have during your trip or during your time of using the product, then you might want to be cautious of that so that way you don't have to recharge your products. Um, I always recommend removing the card and using that in the SD card reader versus taking it and transferring it via the product to the computer, if that makes sense. So use an SD card reader. It'll help your battery life in the long run. Give your device more time to record or do whatever it is that you're trying to do. Examples of card readers out there are what you see in front of you here. You can go crazy and get an expensive one. You can go cheap and get a cheap one. But I do recommend finding something in the middle and get one that works for you. If it has extra bells and whistles that you're never going to use, then don't get the one with the extra bells and whistles. As nice as it is to get maybe something that has a little bit more power or it costs a little bit more because you think it'll perform better, a lot of the times going with the simpler of the items in the card reader world is more than enough to get what you're trying to do done. Once we've now put the SD card into the computer, we're ready to transfer our, informa our information from one device to the other. The next step is to copy the photos to a destination folder. You want to make sure you're moving them, you're, ne you're not moving them, you're copying them. The reason being is that if during transfer, for whatever reason, it doesn't complete or it's unfinished or incomplete or non-correct, it's much easier for you to then copy again to move them over because if you move them, there's a chance you'll lose them during the transfer because you only have the one copy of them that you're moving from one section to the other. If you simply copy them, you're basically duplicating them onto your computer giving you a chance to make sure that you have the source in one location as you're then copying it to another location. Now to create that destination folder, you're either going to use Explorer on Windows or Finder on Mac. You'll open up either of those sections, create a folder. I typically then recommend naming the folder whatever the shoot was. So if you're out taking pictures or videos for your kid's soccer game, Label it the day that they played, maybe label it the kid who played in case you have multiple children, and then label it the date that they played. That's usually a good way for you to then get back and find what you were looking for. There are more complex ways of labeling and um, using a categorization system for your work. I like to lean on a more simplified method, so I go by year by year, then I go month by month within those years, and then I name each of my folders an event that occurred during that photo shoot, so that way I know when I click on that folder what exactly happened that month, that year, and what the event was. So it's a simple organization tool that I use to then organize my work. From there, after we've copied our photos to the first destination folder, we want to copy them to a second place. Now, a second place can be any of the few different things I have listed there, but typically there's one of two options. You're either going to an external hard drive of some sort, or you're going to a cloud-based solution. An external hard drive is great because it's a tangible item, it's a physical device. You're plugging that in, moving the images over, or copying them, I should say, and now you have a, the images saved on a hard drive as well as the computer. On the flip side, if you're using something like a, a um, uh, cloud-based solution, things like Prime Photos or Google Drive, then you have a really nice chance of saving things to the cloud, which allows you to access those anywhere in the world that you're at, as long as you have internet connection. So if you're someone who likes to sit down at the computer and you're constantly going to be traveling and checking your emails via maybe a hotel desk or somewhere else where they have a computer, you might be interested in then using that to save and store your images versus having to lug around a hard drive. One is a physical item, the other one is a username and password that you'll have to remember and keep an eye on. Those are the caveats or trade-offs to it. I personally like the external hard drive. I like, I'm a tangible person, so I like having a tangible item in order to then save all of my information to it. Last thing you're going to do before we finish this up is you're going to eject the card before physically removing it. That is as simple as doing a left click on the item and then selecting eject or dragging it over to the trash can and then ejecting it that way. Once you do that, you can then take the card out and put it back into the camera, format the card inside the camera, and I recommend not to erase it on the reader. The reason being is that it's, much, it's really easy to transfer all the images over. 
Once you insert that card into the camera and you format the card for that camera, you're essentially erasing all the information off of the card and then setting it up so that that card is optimized for that camera's use. It's a really easy way to do it. You don't have to go through and delete each individual item or delete a grouping of any kind. You basically just do a giant erase on it and then you have the card set up so it's formatted for the camera that you're using specifically. So it's a good way of just kind of getting that all situated and set up. Here's what your backup plan should look like. So again, you start with your SD card. That's your primary way of saving the photos that you just took. Saves it from the camera directly into the SD card. That then gets transferred or moved over with your laptop. So you put that into an SD card reader. You can then save all your images to the SD card or from the SD card reader to the computer. Then from there you can edit, change, put them in a destination folder, but you're essentially moving them over to their first source, which should be your computer. From there you can either use one of the two parts on the right side, so a hard drive or a cloud-based solution. I personally like the hard drive because I like having a physical item, but if you're someone who doesn't like to like, like to lug things around, then a cloud-based solution, something like Google Drive or Amazon Photos or Outlook are great ways of saving your photos and your videos without necessarily having to carry around any more products. Try a cloud-based solution if you've never tried one before. It's a good way of at least figuring out if you like it or don't. Google Drive is one of my personal favorites because it's completely free as long as you have a Gmail account, so definitely would recommend looking at that. OneDrive is from Microsoft. If you have Outlook, then you'll have access to OneDrive. Also a good way to go about things. Um, I've never used it personally, but those that I know who have Outlook IDs or Outlook emails, they do like the OneDrive format. And then my personal favorite is the Adobe Creative Cloud. You pay monthly for their services, things like Photoshop, Lightroom, InDesign, Premiere Pro. But on top of that, you do get Creative Cloud or you get a cloud-based solution to store your work. So that's a really nice service if you're someone who wants to edit and do that kind of thing. But then at the same time, you have access to all of their creative apps that you can then change up and use. All are great options if you're trying to get into it. So let's go through a tour of your device. Now I'm gonna break down a couple different devices. I'll talk a little bit in depth about each one of the devices. I have some examples to show off as well too. And then from there, I'll give my synopsis for why this should be something that you add to your product. During this time, if you have one of these devices or you have other questions about the device, feel free to interrupt and ask at any point in time. I'll answer those live for you. So without further ado, let's look at GoPros and action cameras first. So the GoPro is pretty simple itself. Typically it is about a two inch by one inch or two inch, three inch by one and a half inch camera. It's extremely tiny, durable. It's meant for you to bang around and for you to take places with you, but it's really meant to capture everything in one false swoop while delivering a good and, and beautiful image quality and video. The chart on the bottom right corner shows its size and look as compared to a paperclip. So you can see, based on the paperclip size, that this camera is relatively small in stature. But it is very simple. It's a two-button system. The capture button, which is on the very top, should have a red ring around the button, is your video start and stop or your photo button. So depending on the mode that you're in, this is your capture button. This will do the picture taking or the video taking for you, and it will also stop the video as well. Your power button also known as the mode button, lives on the left side of the camera. Now, the power button is pretty self-explanatory. Hold it down, that turns it on, hold it on. Hold it down, it turns it off. So that's your on and off. However, if you use the mode button with one single click, you can toggle through things between time-lapse, photo, and video. So it's a really easy way of navigating the camera's functions and settings and being able to then switch whether you're doing a video, whether you're doing a photo, whether you're doing a time lapse of some sort. And then with the GoPro, it's important to remember that the screen of the GoPro is everything. So the screen itself controls all of your extra features, what's your video quality look like. And I actually think, yes. So the screen controls everything else. The screen is fully touch, uh, touch screen, and it really gives you the ability to wipe through and change some of the following settings. 
On there, you have things like FPS, so frames per second. So you can select how many frames that you have. Typically, if you're doing something that's slow motion or time lapse, you want to use something that has a higher frame per second rating. If you're doing regular standard video, 24 frames per second is more than enough. You can change the angle or lens millimeter size. So my example on this one, if you want, you can set it to be a wide angle. From wide angle, you can then set that to then be a 16 to 34. So the lens will then show you not only what the angle is, wide, tight, zoom, portrait, that sort of thing, but then it'll give you a millimeter size. So for anyone who's used to a traditional camera, these GoPros or action cameras will act like that to give you kind of a quantifying number of, okay, how wide is wide? It's between 16 and 34. Gotcha, okay, that's pretty wide angle. From there on the screen, you can choose this video quality. So do you want 1080, which is your standard HD? 2.7K, which is in the middle between 1080 and 4K, and then 4K being one of your highest. Hindsight is the camera's or GoPro's way of focusing on there. So it gives you the chance to make sure that you're focused in properly on the subject matter you want to be. Hyper smooth, it's the camera's stabilization. So you can make sure that the camera is set up for smooth, uh, the hyper smooth technology, making sure that if things are rocky or bumpy or not in the, you know, not quite smooth, the camera itself will adjust for that so you get a better video. And then on the very front of the camera, there is a front screen. That will show you your video or the duration during a selfie mode, so then you can see what exactly you're recording and for how long you're recording it. So if you have the camera flipped towards you and you're recording yourself, that screen on the front will give you that information as well too, which is really nice. So again, the two buttons, the mode button and your power button, and then also your capture button on there. Those are your main controls for those couple features, but the screen really does everything else. So you have to be aware or get used to the GoPro being a fully touch screen uh, camera. The different modes that you have access to, photo, like I said earlier, so that allows you to capture stills and frames rather than take videos, time lapse, That'll turn the video, if you turn that on, the video, uh, it will then capture a video over a duration of time. Then it will compress the video, then play that captured video over a period of time, which plays within seconds or minutes. So you film whatever it is that, it, that you want to film. Let's say that it's a sunset, that sunset takes three and a half hours. That'll take that three and a half hour video and turn it into about a minute. From there, you can then see the sun rise or set, whatever the video is recording, but it speeds the video up with little to no frame rate reduction. So it makes it look really nice, really clean, um, and it uses a low latency on the camera, so that way it can run for a prolonged period of time. Uh, video, you can record video for whatever duration you want, with whatever quality you want, and you can set features like hyper smooth or hindsight up on the camera, so that way it can focus in or give you a very smooth and clean video that doesn't show a lot of bumps or movement. Here's some examples that I have for it. So if we look on the right side, we can see the uh, motorcyclist as they're going. They end up crashing or falling into the dirt, but you can see how steady that camera is even after the fall. It bops a little bit, but for the most part, it has a really clean image. Same thing with our surfer on the left. He's getting drenched with water, hit with everything from side to side, yet he's still paddling going through even as the wave forms above him and the camera itself does not fall off, which is really nice. Same thing with the picture down below. We can really see the durability on that camera, the movement, just by bumping into the person and hitting them during lacrosse. You can see that the camera stays on top of their head, shows a really clean video. Even with the rockiness and the shakiness, we can still make out a majority of this video and we know exactly what's going on. So that's what you really get with a GoPro. You get this really nice, steady, durable shot with a camera that can take a beating. You don't have to be gentle or fragile like you would have to be with something like a mirrorless or a DSLR camera. You really have the ability to be a little more aggressive with the camera. Um, which is nice, especially if you are someone who wants to film something like this, or if let's say you're a parent and you want to get your kid a camera but you're worried they're going to break it, this would be a nice option because you know how durable the camera is. And so why use an action camera, and I use these four little images for example, 
If you look at the top left corner, there's about a million different accessories you can buy for this camera. You can really get an accessory that fits your needs for really whatever the event is. It doesn't matter what is happening. If you're doing something like biking or dirt biking or ATVing or you're just driving across the country or maybe you're getting in a plane and you want to do a fun video, using something like all the different harnesses and time lapse features and what have you is really cool and it's amazing what you can do with it. On the right corner you see that this person probably has a chest strap on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Ugh. Not enough coffee today. If you look, you can see that they probably have a chest strap on or some sort of mount that keeps the camera on their chest, which gives you this really cool first person view. Bottom left corner, we have someone in the water with it. They've got a little gimbal around their phone or around the GoPro, so they're able to take it underwater and hold on to it, which is really nice. And then you have the dogs digging on the beach. You get the harness on them, so just a fun video. So really, GoPros, similar to something like a drone, they can kind of go places that we can't, and they have really cool features that allow them to see a lot, pick up a lot, without necessarily having the camera be so bulky or you're worried about damaging your, your favorite camera and lens. There's a lot of benefits to a GoPro, um, more than just having, be having the ability to record or do something kind of funny. Drones. Now these are probably the most popular of the different ones in this class. Drones have become extremely powerful in the last few years um, and they're just extremely good products that can really be used for a whole lot of different things. So getting into drones, there's a lot of different drone types so keep that in mind. The main one we're going to be talking about today and the main only one that you see in the pictures over here is the quadcopter. The reason we call it a quadcopter is because it has four blades. Other styles of drones, so single rotor, that's going to look like your typical helicopter. You're not going to see that for most drones because they have uh, drones have cameras on there for the most part. Single rotors don't have a lot of good articulation, nor do they have good st stabilization. So for single rotors. For single rotors, it's mainly going to be a toy. Quadcopter is going to be the most popular style of drone sold on a consumer level. And you're going to have two main styles for that. Your FPV drone, which will need goggles to fly, but typically only comes as a quadcopter. And then a Cinedrone, which flies as a quadcopter as well, but it has a high quality camera and usually has things like tracking features on there. So that way you get better stabilization and better focusing. Now if you get really fancy and you are an expert at flying, you move to Hollywood, you get your license, hexacopters might open up for you. That's a six-bladed copter. And that's great for filming and stability in the air. Those are products where you're not going to see them on a consumer level, but you will see them on more of a high-end level uh, for movie productions, film productions. Since we've gotten to the point where drones are extremely powerful, you don't really see companies uh, doing the helicopter filming anymore or plane filming. A lot of the times they'll just use a drone and have a camera attached to it in order to get certain shots. And then a fixed wing rotor. This is more of a plane experience. It's great for people who want less of a copter experience and more of a plane. But similar to a single rotor brother, you're not really going to see these sold with a camera on there. These are mainly fun, more activity based drones. Whereas a quadcopter and a hexacopter uh, are really made for physically filming and getting that sort of thing done. Controllers are a little different and they can, there's two different models that you'll see. The first standard controller is on the left side. There will be no built-in screen for that one. You'll plug your phone into that and then that's how you're controlling that controller. Everything the drone sees you see on the phone. From there the controller hooks up to the actual drone itself and you're able to then control everything. On the right hand side we have the RC remote and the RC remote is nice because it has a built in screen. If you're someone who doesn't want to constantly be looking at your phone while you fly, the ones with the built in screen work really nice and they're a really nice option to look at because then you don't need to worry about having your phone as well. Drones are going to have, or controllers for the drones are going to have some of these controls. 
For the most part, these are the ones that you'll see on every single drone. However, all will differ because everybody makes theirs a little bit differently. But first and foremost, control sticks. Each stick will have different customizable settings, but one joystick will control your up and down movement as well as the rotation. The other one will control front and backwards and side to side. So control sticks really make your drone move and they control the basis of what your drone is doing. So keep that in mind when you're looking at these that they're gonna be, not to say the bread and butter, but that's one of the most important settings of the drone is the control over it. Antennas, you're gonna point those outwards. These are the connection point between you and the drone. So the controller and the drone connect via the antennas that are on the controller. Now, if you have a, contr a controller, and I'll go back to the next last slide. If you have a controller like on the left side, the antenna is gonna be in that top portion where it says number 10. That's where the antenna is gonna be pointing out to the sky and touching. Whereas when we look at the image on the right, we can see those two sticks coming off the back. That's the antenna for that part of the drone or for that part of the controller. So controllers will look a little different between the two different products. However, they function the same. They're the connection point that gets you between the drone and the controller. And those different points of contact are what's pointed outwards and scanning the air to make sure that that, that signal is maintained. On the back left of your, or on the back of your controller, you're going to have a dial. The two dials are for two different things. One is a gimbal dial, and that's rotational control over drone's camera. And then you're going to have another one that controls the zoom on there. That's going to control how much you zoom in and out using the drone. Now, zoom is usually going to be digital zoom on these drones, but it also... It also depends on the product that you have. So some of the lower end drones will not have good zoom, while some of the higher end drones will. All drones are a little different, so if that's something you're concerned about, the zoom, I would definitely do the research on the drone before you purchase anything. Uh, your record button. Clicking this will start the record or take a picture. Focus and shutter. This will give you a refocus on what you're filming or shooting, and it will give you control over the shutter as well, too. So if there's a different speed you want, or you're trying to refocus the shutter, uh, that's what's gonna be able to do that for you. And typically that's a dial of some sort that'll do that, and it depends on the model that you have. A lot of these controllers, like if I go back a slide, they're gonna have two different dials on the back trigger. So if you look at the one on the right, you'll see two dials on the pads on the right corner and the left corner. Same thing if we look at the image on the left, you're gonna see dials on the back of the controller itself that then you can toggle and change as you're going. So things to remember with the drone. Now there's a lot of control over the drone because our federal government is the one who controls these guys. So keep that in mind. That local and state government technically do not have any say over the physical drones. It is only your federal government that does. So a couple things that are on there are geofencing. Now geofencing is a virtual wall. The virtual wall basically prevents the drone from pushing forward or flying in this area. Typically the fencing exists by airports, government buildings, national parks, and certain cities or properties. So geofencing is the way that your drone monitors your flight behavior. Now in certain areas, fencing is more prominent than others, and in certain areas you can't take off or fly your drone at all. They do this to protect not only themselves, but to protect you. Because the government is federally uh, monitoring our airspace and doing stuff, if you fly too close to some of these protected properties or areas, technically these people can send out their own police departments and their own services to investigate and confiscate products that are coming in their airspace. Um, however, though, if you're following the rules properly, even if you have a drone that is very high-end and up-to-do, as long as you're following the correct protocols for it, technically there's not much that someone can do as long as you're not breaking any rules or laws. Now, Proverse phone controller, other than the fact that a phone goes into the physical controller, the drone will require some form of screen to be used when flying. DJI, for example, will have you connect your phone to the controller. Other pro controllers will have a built-in screen, and they will show you everything on that screen. So, again, everything I showed you on the last slide and this last line here, they come together. So, really, the big difference on the pro controller, you've got a built-in screen. On the non-pro controller, 
you have your phone that you can then attach to. And you will need to attach your phone, unfortunately. You really can't fly without it because they require you to see what the camera sees as you're flying. So very similar to our DJI, uh, our, our GoPro cameras, the camera and the drones are very similar in the sense that everything gets really controlled from the screen. So on the screen, you're going to see the distance from you and the drone. That'll be a clear indication of how far away it is, as well, too, as the altitude of the drone. So how high is the drone and how far away is it? It gives you the ability to switch between photo and video right on the screen. Gives you a nice map with geofencing and surrounding areas so you know where you're flying, where you're at. Gives you the ability to start or stop the active track feature on the drone, which is really nice. Uh, and then return to home. If you're flying and you need to return automatically to where you took off from, you can press the RTH button. But if you need to land immediately and you're not concerned about coming back to where you took off from, then you can use the immediate land button that's on the screen as well. Big thing to understand with drones is permits. Now, drones are going to require some form of permit depending on the weight class that you're using. If you have a drone that weighs less than 249 grams legally by the state or by the uh, by the United States government, you do not need to register your drone. However, if it is above 249 grams, you need to register. There are two main per, per, uh, permits that you can purchase. If you have a drone under 249 grams, remember you don't need either of these. It's only if you're number one, above 249, or two, if you plan on using this work for commercial or business pay. So for example, if you are registering your drone, this can all be accessed on the FAA.gov website, and it costs about $5, includes a course of information needed to be read. After completion, you now clearly just need to write out the permit number on the drone. A lot of people will just get a sticker, write that out, and stick it right under the drone. That protects you in the case of if someone stops you or asks questions. Not only is your drone now up to the standards and registered, but you're also now in the system. So at any point in time, you can check things out, see where you're located, make sure you can fly, that sort of thing. If you want to do this for business, so if you're someone who says, wow, I can use my drone to make some money, film commercials, do everything else. That is great, you can absolutely do that. However, now you're gonna need your part 107. The part 107, you pay about $175, you take a course on flying. After completion, you then have to take a test. Once you pass that test, you can then do commercial uh, or business based on work that you're uh, with your drone. So if you wanna make some money off of that, make sure you get your part 107. Uh, you pay about 175 bucks, take the course, take the classes, and then you're good to go. If you don't want to do that and you are got a bigger drone, 249 bucks, that's your register, or sorry, 200, uh, over 249 grams, you need that $5 registration. If you're not going to register, you have a drone that weighs less, it's 249 or less, then you're fine. You don't need to register as long as you're not doing any work for commercial or business use. Here's some examples for drones. Now, why would I personally get a drone? Drones are really exciting. You can get to new heights. You can take videos unlike anything before. You have this really cool ability of getting tracking shots on there. That's what you see in the top left. You have these abilities to get oversweeping or just nice larger than life photos. That's something like the Brooklyn Bridge on the right side. But then you also have the ability to really just dive in and explore and see different parts of the world, similar to what you're seeing in the bottom right corner with the beaches. Um, for anybody who is in Illinois, it's cold, it is snowy, it's rainy. So I miss that. I miss beaches right now. <laughs> but regardless, you can go that route as well too. So that's a really nice part about these drones is that their features um, are not just limited to flying and recording. They have really awesome tracking or following features or really give the user an ability to make something look bigger than life. Now, why use a drone? Drones are extremely cool. I chose these four images to really show everything off. 
If we look at the top left corner, you see this mountain ridge, you see some people standing on the mountain ridge. In order to get that picture of them, they would have had to rent out a helicopter or get some sort of service that could drive past them. In the case of the drone, they just climb up to the top, send the drone out, and then they can start recording themselves or taking videos of themselves while they're there. Same thing in the top right, you can see this beautiful symmetry of the wall and how it's curved and rounded, as well too as the green and the other colors that are coming from the beach. That's a pretty cool feature. Things like the one in the bottom left corner, you get the larger than life feel, but a very tight zoomed in feel. So again, taking a picture of what we see, but then at the same time, zooming in, cropping up a little bit, and just getting a clean fit picture from above also makes a really nice look. And then lastly, you've got the group photography session. If you've got a company or a group, an outing, or anything else where you want to get a picture taken of everybody, a drone is a really great option because nobody has to stand behind the camera. You don't have to hand your camera off to everybody and have everybody squeeze in. You can fly the drone to the very top of where you guys are at on the screen, make sure it's where you want it to be. Put the controller behind your hand and simply pull the trigger and get a really clean photo of the group for whatever purposes, for the holiday card, for your personal information, for what have you. The family is a good example of it too, but using your drone to get larger than life images or to get images that would somewhat be, have been harder to get, given if you didn't have um, a drone available, is what I would use these for. It's for those shots that we don't necessarily get to take just with our regular camera standing. We need a little extra oomph to get us to the distance. Camcorders. So camcorders are pretty simple. There's not a lot to them. But a camcorder would be really ideal for someone who's looking to make movies or videos. It's not going to be for your average person. I get a lot of mom and dads or grandparents who come in that want a camcorder. They realize that a mirrorless or a DSLR camera can do what these can do. So it really comes down to the fact that people are interested in a camcorder just for the sole purpose of recording. So things that you're going to get on there, your power button, pretty self-explanatory, that's your on and off. Your record button, also self-explanatory, that's, that's your ability to uh, record the video or stop recording. Zoom toggle, usually on the lens, gives you the ability to zoom in and take your picture. Uh, photo button, while you're recording your video, you can press the photo button, take a picture. Um, focus dial or knob. Most cameras, and not all cameras, have the ability to focus or change the dial on the physical camera. Um, something else I might look at would be um, oh, no, I'm sorry, I, I, I misspoke there. Um, you have a focus dial or a knob. Oh, sorry, a focus knob or dial. Basically, what a focus dial or a knob is is it gives you the ability to make sure that you're focused in on your subject. Where I was going was, all cameras have manual focus, but they also all have autofocus. When you're recording, it's much better to use the focus knob or dial in order to get that video, because then if things walk in front or change in your view, you can use the focus knob or dial to change your, auto, your focusing habits, so that way you stay on your subject. So camcorders are gonna have that as well as an iris or aperture control, which is controlling that iris or that center dot for your background to foreground relationship while you're shooting on your camera. Shutter speed is gonna control how much light is getting let in. White balance is controlling how white the whites of your video look or what you're offsetting that stark white color with, whether that be more red or blue or, or CMYK color scheme, if you will. And then playback controls too. The ability to then hit the playback button, see exactly what you recorded, and then kind of do a watch through to make sure that that's what you wanted for that shot. Most controls, if not all controls, are stuff you're going to see on mirrorless cameras today. Some people will buy camcorders just solely for the purpose because that's all they want to do is record video. But if you are in the market for both a still or a video camera, rest assured that you can buy a Sony or a Canon or a Nikon, and you're gonna have the ability to do both video and photo with most of, if not all, the same controls that you see up here. Important settings that you can change on camcorders, so video quality. 
setting your camera for HD or 4K or any other qualities that your camcorder is capable of. Stabilization, so setting your camera to have the image stabilization on, that ensures that you're not going to have a shaky video. Face detection, so most cameras will have an auto face detection, which depending on what you're filming can help keep humans in focus. Again, depending if that's something that you want, you can always turn that off and do manual focus. Frame rate, so the rate at which you're capturing frames or your video. Less of the rate, better for simple or standard video. That's around 24 frames a second. And if you're doing something faster or something like sports or action, then, or, or even slow-mo, then you can use a faster rated um, F, uh, frames per second. So that way you get more quality out of that. Uh, bit rate, so setting this will help make sure that the way that your camera is taking information, it does it to the rate that you want it to. The higher the rate quality on there for the bit rate, the more changes or the deeper editing you can do, the lesser, the less that you can really change and edit on there, so keep that in mind. And then your exposure on there, controls the darkness or the lightness of your video as you're going, but by the whole frame, not just by certain points of the uh, video or the image section. For this, I really didn't have too many examples on here, but really, why would you want to use a camcorder? If we look at the top left image, most camcorders have a handle of some sort that loops around the hand that makes it extremely ergonomic and friendly to record. So if you're someone who has problems with holding things or you don't like things around your neck, using a camcorder might be a great idea because you can keep it around your wrist for the majority of what you're trying to do. As well, too, using camcorders really gives you a nice cinematic look. If you look at the bottom left corner, you see a gentleman by a train station. The look of the color and the saturation of the video has a really nice cinematic quality to it. We look at the top right corner, you get this more cinematic pullback where because of the built-in stabilization on the camera, you don't need things like gimbals or tripods. You can really hold it in your hand and walk around and do stuff while still retaining that image quality and that stabilization. Camcorders are also great because of the attachments you can add on. On the bottom right corner, you can see that there is a microphone, there's a mixing board, there's a whole lot of different setting or material that's on that camcorder, so you can make it as professional and beef it up as much as you want, or you can make it as simple as what the woman in the top left corner has. That's the versatility of camcorders, that you can be very professional with it and get movie-like quality, or you can be as simple with it and just use it for your vacation or your fun videos or whatever have you. Last but not least, when we talk about things that are beyond our traditional camera, are going to be 360 cameras. 360 cameras are becoming one of the more popular cameras you see nowadays. People use them for social media, people use them for vlogging, people use them for all sorts of stuff. But the cool part about 360 cameras is that there's two 180 degree lenses on either side of the device. Those are recording simultaneously. And the area that the camera then sits in the middle is what we call the seam line. And that'll play an important part in some of the features that I'll tell about next. However, these cameras are really cool because they offer the user the flexibility of changing perspective. And if you're using things like VR goggles, these cameras can, come extremely, uh, can become extremely handy for VR. So without further ado, features that you get on a 360 camera. So works and functions like all other action cameras. They're durable, they're waterproof. You can use one lens at a time, uh, which is really cool. Where they're, oh, and they're touch screen, two button, fundamentally fun, uh, foundation. So it's really the same thing as your regular action or GoPro camera. However, they have two 180 degree firing cameras on them. So that's where they differ from your traditional uh, GoPro camera. It's going to work with one or both cameras, so again, you can set it up so you can have one lens firing or both lenses firing at the same time. You can hide or make selfie sticks invisible. That's what we call the seam line. So where the two cameras meet, they basically will then negate the actual uh, selfie stick, and it will almost look like the camera's floating by itself. It's a really cool feature that these things have. Creates a third-person view unlike other cameras. Because this is going to be sitting above you or around you, you get to create this third person view like the camera's following or keeping track of you while recording your other surroundings or settings. V 
Videos can be viewed with a VR headset. So if you're recording in 360 and then you put a VR headset on to view the video, you can actually turn your head and view the space that you recorded in in 3D, which really submerses you in the video. So if you're trying to do walkthroughs or any other really cool features or videos, you can get a really fun kind of setup by using these VR goggles. So another really cool feature that's on there. Uh, and they're small, compact, and they're durable. Much like their action cameras, they take a beating, they're easy to transport, they use total, a bunch of different accessories. They're very, just cool cameras in general. So, on the top left corner, using the camera and using your phone, you're able to shift the perspective and change whatever point of viewing that you want to be on. So you can see that just by dragging it around, you can change the perspective that you're at. And then so that way, whoever viewing is viewing the video can view from a different perspective. You can shift that so that you have the control over that setting, but you can also leave it up to the viewer so they can change that and have control over the setting, which is really cool. On the bottom of the screen, you can see that there is an, a phone with all of these settings on there. Most of, if not all of these cameras, Insta360 being the leading seller on this, have really cool apps that give you the ability to control all of the settings on there, whether that's color, exposure, white balance, um, metering, photo video, uh, editing the duration or splicing together videos. You can do that all right from the phone itself. So if you're someone who wants to go through the settings and change things, um, that's where you can do it without having to plug it into the computer and edit. You can do it on your phone, which makes it really, really easy and quick on the go use. The other thing that I really like too is that it does this really fun perspective play where as you walk around and you do stuff, it almost makes it feel like you're walking on a really tiny globe, picking up all of the stuff around you. And that's what the top right corner shows. Gentleman's drinking his coffee. He's got the selfie stick on, which is invisible. So it really just looks like the camera's floating above his head. But we're able to see everything around him in kind of this weird fisheye lens view. So you get this crazy perspective from the camera that's unlike others. Why use 360 cameras? I would use one if I was someone who was interested in using VR technology and showing off a bunch of different spaces or area. I might also be interested in a 360 camera if I was looking for something fun for my kids, something easy to use, but something that really was different from a traditional camera. The other reason why I probably would use a 360 camera would just be to get fun angles or to try different things, switch perspective, and have the ability to really customize my videos in a unique or exciting way. There's a lot of things that a 360 camera does that you won't see on a lot of other products, which I think is really awesome and unique. And that's really all I got for you guys. This is one of the quicker classes. But next week we're in for another mouthful, so we've got the beginner of uh, beginning camera class because we'll be starting in February, so we pick up. Next month we do have five Thursdays, so the week of the 22nd I will not be teaching a class. So that Thursday, fe uh, February 22nd, there will be no camera class. So just to kind of give you an idea of the schedule going for next month, intro to cameras will be on the 1st of February. On the 8th, we'll have intermediate camera class. On the 15th, we will have advanced camera class. And on the 29th, we will be teaching this class again, the beyond traditional camera class. So if anybody has questions or comments or concerns, you can reach me at this phone number or this email. I'm here every day except for Tuesday and Wednesdays. Um, come in if you've got questions on a product that you purchased from us. Come in if you have questions on a product in general. If you're curious about certain cameras or any other information, I can do my best to answer those questions for you. But in general, if there's anything that you need, just give me a call, shoot me an email, whatever's easier for you, I'll help you out with that. We're done a little early. Usually this goes till about 6.37. Um, it is 6.21. I'll give it a couple more minutes. If you guys got any other questions or things for me, just reach out. Um, I'll leave this open for a little bit. And if anybody chats, I'll answer that.
All right, well, it doesn't look like anybody has any major questions for me right now, so I'll cut the video short here. If anything comes up in the next couple weeks, in the next week before my next camera class, by all means, reach out, email, call me, anything that you need. If not, keep taking pictures, stay out there. I know it's cold, but use the time to maybe take some indoor photography or go enjoy outside and take some pictures of the snow and the wildlife that is. So have a great night, everybody. Happy Thursday, happy weekend, and as always, I'll see you next week for Intro to Cameras.